Welcome, everybody. Uh, I am honored and happy to be here. This is my first time presenting for uh, All Things Open. I have been attending for a few years. Uh, and I just want to start off, first of all, with a moment of gratitude, which is something from the culture where I work. Uh, and I want to be able to just I start out by saying uh, thank you to Todd and to all the staff and volunteers who make ATO happen. Uh, this is an incredible event. Uh, and I am just extremely thankful to them. I'm thankful to all of you for taking your time. This is, uh, this is very, very different. Uh, this is the first time that I've made this kind of a broadcast presentation. Um, so I just want to thank you this. I'll thank you for attending and this opportunity. And also thank you to my company Optic for this opportunity to, uh, to be able to share this uh, talk with you. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the background of talking just a uh, in just a second. Uh, I titled it the five pillars of security success. Uh, but just a little bit about me. Uh, as I said, I am a senior principal engineer for Optum. Uh, I am an old school guy. If you can't tell by, uh, by all of this, yeah, I've been around for a while. Uh, if you blend the time that I've been in IT and cybersecurity, uh, it's hitting the third decade now. And so yeah, I've, I've started out uh, basically doing uh, network, uh, I worked for GE for a few years and moved my way over into software later on, did a lot of different type of uh, programming and some very old archaic languages. Hopefully you don't have any of them in your infrastructure anymore. Uh, <laughs> moved along uh, through many parts of the stack as it were. Got into cybersecurity, uh, going through college, found a big interest for it. Uh, actually was told by a friend of colleague said, hey, you know, you might want to think about that as a career. That's a good thing. I thought, you know, maybe I will. It's kind of a fun thing. Uh, I'm sort of a, a hacking aficionado. I enjoy hackathons. As you can see, uh, I take part in several different programs. Uh, we have an internal program at Optum called the Technology Leadership Career Path. I am a member of that. Uh, I have an internal podcast where I work. Uh, I am certified through SANS, through GIAC, so I've gone through that. I'm also the chapter president for a local chapter of the Cloud Security Alliance. So I do try to live uh, what, I, what I learn and share those out to the community at large. Uh, I do believe that education uh, is a lifelong endeavor. And as you can see there in the bottom right, when I'm not uh, busy doing security, then my passion obviously is guitar. Uh, I love the blues. Uh, Remember the times uh, back when uh, guys like Gary Moore and Eric Clapton were all the rage and some of my major influences. And so really with this talk, what I wanted to talk about in terms of security success, uh, I want to kind of point out that when we think of pillars of security, these are not the ones that you're traditionally familiar with. And obviously I'm not going to try and use Jedi mind control on you. I don't have that skill. When we think about the differences between security and security success, the pillars of security all around compliance. And I promise you that for those of you who listened to Alyssa's talk earlier, we had no prior communication onto this. So you're probably gonna see some common themes here that is simply coincidence. Um, and I think it's a happy coincidence uh, because it means obviously we're speaking to the same things. When we talk about uh, you know, the pillars within security success, we're really talking about security within DevOps or DevSecOps or SecDevOps, however you choose. Uh, the biggest threats really to the organization, um, this comes as how I explained this program. And I'll tell you in just a moment why I got into this, but it's really communicating to your organization the lack of understanding what those risks are. How do we talk about uh, embracing learning as part of what we do every day and enabling these security skills. Uh, this applies to mitigating all the growing tax services that we have now, and especially as we all are in the cloud. And so this talk really comes from my experience in implementing a program internally. Uh, and I really felt a strong need to, to really convince the, the C-suite, you know, the CEO and all the C-suite folks that the return on investment doesn't really come in hard dollars. It comes more in value that you get through increased productivity and the knowledge of security. Now that sounds all great and good, but when we think about how do we become skilled in security, it's a step-by-step -step process. Nobody comes into this business knowing everything about it. 
and it changes incrementally over time and it changes in different varying speeds. If I think back to when I first started, you know, back in the days of guys like Cliff Stoll, you know, and when he was battling this hacker group from overseas through the phone lines, I was just first coming into this going, what? Through a phone line? It's changed so much faster now. And the, the question that we really fail to understand sometimes, especially from a management perspective, is the expectation that anybody can instantly become an expert in security. It's just not reality. And often the pushback you get is, well, if that's such a problem, why do we want to invest in these individuals? And the answer to that really is because the return comes greater. It's, it's, it's that story that you hear often between the CIO and the CEOs talking. You, you've heard this before. The CIO says, what happens if we train all of our people and then they leave? And the CEO says, well, what happens if we don't and they stay? All right. It's the chicken versus the egg kind of thing. So the challenge that you want to be able to take to your senior management is addressing the fact that the investment pays off before asking for funding. And I'll go into that in a little bit detail in just a little bit, but it kind of leaves you asking that question. OK, how do we do some of these things? Because oftentimes there's a big gap in many organizations between people who are in the DevSecOps roles and operations and business roles and the C-suite. How do you communicate with them? How do you get them to understand that a risk-based approach is really part of the key to this answer? And these are the questions that I asked and that were asked of me. Being able to communicate to them and tell them that the lack of sensitivity for security to the risks that are within the organization, the products we deliver, is a key problem. Also, not having enough skilled security resources across the organization. This is not new information. You can look at all the statistics. There's a great shortage within cybersecurity for all skill sets, for both men and women within dev and ops and security as a blending of this. This is a lack that has to be addressed. There's also the challenge of enabling and enticing the organization to grow the security skills, whether they're technical or not. Everybody benefits by having an awareness and a part and a say within security within your organization. Being able to understand that it's a relationship that is between everybody who's in security and everybody who considered it isn't, right? And that tends to be the dichotomy, right? We have those who are the security experts and those who are not. This is a problem because we need to have this blended and it's a strained relationship. Even our technical partners, they have challenges just trying to complicate, just trying to accomplish their security tasks for each product or product line they have. So how can we address this? And this is the question that I had. Well, the first step was finding a trusted ally. And that happens to come through the CISO. Now you wonder, wonder why would I want to do this? Well, if you think about it in business terms, the CISO's job is to protect the business. And it's the CISO's job to work with the CIO and the rest of the C-suite to make sure that the business needs aren't compromised in terms of security. And so if you want to have that level of trust, working with your CISO is a key aspect. And this is something that I realized early on. If I could find a connection, if I could find someone who could make that introduction for me and explain my case to him, maybe it was to him, and then listen to his needs. And that's the important thing because this can't just be about what you try to put into your organization. Listening to what this person who has far more experience than I did was very key in my understanding what keeps him up at night, right? And so forming that allied partnership really only can come from a culture where this individual is accessible because there's the bridge. There's the way to be able to get support an endorsement to get this program there. Now, before I go into more of the details, I want to kind of I want to talk about these these five pillars that I that I've constructed, and I want to show you a roadmap that I use to build this within an organization, and you can follow this for your own organization. This is meant to be more agnostic to a product and more about a process, and even more succinctly about the culture. And so as you keep in mind, this is just an example of this system. And there's some products that I will mention, sure. 
keep in mind, you know, your mileage can vary, but you can follow these. And, and then if you have questions, I'm more than happy to engage with you and give you some more details on this. So when we talk about these five pillars of security success, the first one is mindset. And we all know people who talk about this. So Alyssa talked about it too. It's that mindset that comes from experience and it also comes from accepting others' opinions and expertise into this thing. That gets turned into the culture. With a culture that focuses on security as part of the daily business, then the topics aren't so strained. Taking these two, then the next part comes is training. Being able to have an inclusive culture where training is part of daily processes and part of an ongoing process helps support that. It keeps you flexible as an organization. It also keeps you current on things. The next comes ownership. And lastly, with ownership also comes the ability to lead from that. But it doesn't just stop at that because while you can put every bit of effort into driving towards these four areas, if you don't take the time to recognize individuals for their accomplishments, and I'll go a little bit of detail into more detail in just a bit about how you can actually enable them, then everything else will fall short very quickly because people for a short time will be satisfied in the work, but when you don't recognize them and reward them for these efforts, they don't stay. So when we talk about security mindset, I love this from Bruce Schneier. You all know who he is. I've got the book. You've probably got several of his books. It's thinking about how things can fail. But keep in mind for a second, this doesn't mean that you have to be a pessimist, right? This is not the negative mindset. This is meant to be objective in how you look at how a given system can fail. And the planned contingencies around this, this isn't new. Many organizations do this. The military is a good example of contingency planning. What they do does not take away from the primary mission, but instead it puts the focus on when something goes wrong, what's the response? How do you handle it? So the mission itself does not become compromised. And it seems like an anti-pattern, but let's not forget when we talk about implementing security, this is different than we talk about when we say privacy, and Schneier goes into this as well, and that's something for another time of talk. But the culture is key in this, and if you have a culture where you don't reward failure, and I love this from Adam Savage, this guy just, just tickles me completely. Failure is always an option, right? Even when things go wrong, if you consider what Adam always insists on, it's still a result right? But we ignore this as a culture. Why? If you think about best practices within the cloud, every guide that's written on it, and yes, I'm preaching from the Cloud Security Alliance, but it makes the point. It starts with failure in mind. It's not a negative mindset. It's thinking of the parts of the processes that are normally forgotten, and you put guardrails around that to mitigate what they call the blast radius. Organizations have done this forever. And if you're not convinced, take a look at the space program. Failure is always a part of that planning process. Elon Musk knows this. SpaceX knows this and they plan for this. That's how Crew Dragon got to the International Space Station and back safely. Thinking about the things that can go wrong Planning for those contingencies as part of your culture is key. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, that's kind of a nice speech. How do we get there? How do we start down this path where we can get security in as part of the culture? Well, if you want to beat this guy, training obviously is where it starts. And a very common analogy within martial arts is, it takes 10,000 hours to learn a specific skill and 100,000 hours to master it. Yes, that's very extreme. And my sensei has pounded that into my head many times, but it makes the point because it's practice and dedication, building core competency, right? You can't defend what you don't practice and you can't be aware you're not learning 
if the learning doesn't come from a part of your culture, right? So a learning culture is key and it's, it's got to be part of what you do daily. So if we think about what is security culture, this quote, this quote kind of tickles me in a way because it's, it's what happens when people are left to their own devices. Well, it's really not that. It's kind of funny to think of this in the worst possible case scenarios because people, when they're left to their own devices in group think, what usually happens, right? Mob mentality takes it over. It's interesting to think about that, but if we really think what culture is in and of itself, culture is just a set of common understandings where these understandings are shared in a language that has a shared pattern of meanings and a shared value of beliefs, and they're integral within the organization. If you think about what Cotter and Heskett just defined culture as, they call it a predictor of business outcomes, it means revenues and growth, right? So in this vein of thought, security culture has four commonalities. It's shared by common values of an organization. What is most important to us as a whole? Shared thinking, right? This is not individual think, this is group think. And this is not waiting until the gates happen as Alyssa pointed out. This is putting it into every part of the process, right? I like, I like the point she said, why are you waiting till a gate comes along before you do threat modeling? You can threat model a user story in your backlog. Absolutely, that's shared thinking, that's shared input. You can follow Showstack's model down to that level and apply that. You don't have to wait until you flow the whole thing out. It's a great way to adapt to that, right? Being able to use the same vocabulary, the same awareness patterns and the same best practices and communicate them clearly. And this is a shared approach. This gets everybody involved. This is not just a developer side of this thing. This is the ops side too, because if you think about it from a full stack perspective, what we as developers hand off to the ops folks, if we don't have an understanding of that in a partnership, then we're kicking it across the wall. And that's not DevOps. That's not being fully inclusive in that. And putting security into that helps drive that, right? It's not just a dev problem. Most importantly, the security culture is shared by everyone. Everybody has an approach to this. Everybody has something to contribute and everyone should have a seat at the table. It's a problem for all sides of the house, not just dev. It's dev, security, and the operational parts of that as well. So how can we develop this culture where it's shared by everyone? Where we develop these common values, these common thinking and approaches and enhance the organization's footprint. So the structure that I, I thought about this when I built this here, and is something that's repeatable, but it can be if can fall into these patterns. Before you do, however, I really recommend that you go back to what I talked about and you make it your allies. You want to have the CISO, the CIO, the C-suite partnering with you, talk through this as an approach with them. Get an understanding of what their pain points are and then work on a delivery plan because when you build consensus and then you say, here's a structure we can follow, then your chances of success will be greater. So when you try to put together a framework like this, there's five key areas that you start with, okay? And that's learning, right? Learning in terms of staying current upon key security areas, right? What is cloud security? You just saw a great talk by Sean talking about how to take a cookie mindset and apply that across so many applications. That's a great teaching opportunity, right? Applying it, being able to take those lessons, take those examples, and now put it into your code. And then obviously the lifting part. This is, okay, let's get this into our repos. Let's get this into GitHub and Artifactory and all these other places to keep this. And let's get this down to where we can actually show something. This creates an opportunity because the opportunity comes from people who have gone through this process to now step up and show others. And most importantly, you wanna be able to recognize this. So when we think about training, training has the two components that you saw earlier. There's the learning and the applying. Doing it incrementally is a great way to make this a part of the regular daily work. And this does work when you Work with your developers to let them know 
as you're going through these things, when you're in your sprint cycle, think about the learn one, teach one approach, right? Or you may call it shared programming, but giving your developers and architects and everybody on the outside the bandwidth to become trainers. If you think about it from the information that you already have there, what you're gaining from a conference like this is a library of information. If you question, wait a minute, we don't really have a whole lot of training resources. Actually, you do. You're on a conference right now that has tons. Of These are teachable things that you can take. So why not take something like this back and put it into a security context within your organization? Now, internally, before COVID, obviously, this was best done for our organization. We would get together with rapid development sessions. One department could, could propose a lunch and learn and send the broadcast out. Hey, we'd like to show you the latest things that we've done in Kubernetes. And here's some really cool things you might find useful. These are things that you can take in these small group sessions. Obviously from the work from home model now we have, this has changed the mode of delivery, but it's still the same. So incorporating a learning program is probably the biggest challenge to overcome. Now, many organizations have things like Precipio, they have things like LearnSource, Safari. This is good content for some core things, but you need to incorporate it because it's gotta be current and it needs to be relevant. Again, a great reference point is to all things open, the content we have here, you can take these things and integrate them. If you're in an organization where you don't have access to some of the bigger platforms, you can still construct your own off open source uh, items, uh, you can use things uh, such as common CMS uh, to be able to set up your own learn library. The purpose is you agree upon a shared organization. And with a plan like this, it's easier to be able to go to the C-suite and say, you know, we would like to be able to hire some train the trainer resources and teach our most senior people how to become a trainer. How do you put together something that can be delivered in training content, right? Don't worry about perfection, but focus on progress, right? Because this is part of the growth path and it's a growth mindset. The benefit from this, that is this comes from within. Nobody knows your organization better than you do. You're inside of this thing. You're learning it, you're living it, and you're sharing it. And, it sh and sharing those with around you is how you can drive this. So if you don't have the budget for commercial learning products, you can look at these senior individuals. This is the greatest investment that you could ever have because this small amount of time in teaching one is gonna pay off quickly. Now, keep in mind that realistically, this is an incremental process. And so I'll show you in just a second how we actually set this up and structured it using GitHub. And this is an incremental thing where we defined levels that were considered novice and intermediate and more advanced skill sets. And we did it from a community learned approach. We talked to people across the organization. We talked to the senior engineers, the senior architects, the senior analysts. What were the things in the use cases that were on their mind that they had constantly come into them? If you're not sure where to start with this, refer to Alyssa's approach on that. You can start with things like threat modeling and automation. Don't try to boil the ocean because that's too much, but you can take it on a piecemeal approach. And I did this internally. I created an internal co course and then I presented it over and over again. The more I presented it, the more comfortable I got with presenting it and the more reach that it happened. It, it got out to everybody in there. And now I'm happy to say that some of the best and the brightest which you will recognize and see, stepped up and said, hey, I really get this. I like this. Now they're trainers. Now this program is starting to take a path forward because now there are more people who are able to deliver this content. Again, don't overdo it when you try to write these things, right? Understand where the skill sets are and then build incrementally, right? If you think about threat modeling and you take it in that approach where you address a small piece at a time, and you keep going through the cycle, you create these channels of topics. You could incrementally increase the levels of learning by making the challenges a little bit harder, right? And that's what we did. The first ones were, okay, take one component of your application, demonstrate what a boundary is around it, and list out two things that could possibly be vulnerabilities. And then what would you do about them? Now create those use cases and do that in a pull request to GitHub. Bam, you're done. As a developer, you're already doing these things. And even some operation teams I've seen do this now. 
this is part of the daily work. And this is how we started this progress and got this rolling, right? This is the application of it. It's taking what you've learned, now showing it. We all do our code pull requests and submitting them. This is a great way to keep that. And it keeps the core knowledge within that. So I started with these four topics just to get the ball rolling. And the purpose was to have them do two things, generate artifacts to show their knowledge and complete the work that's in the same vein as what they do already. So starting with threat modeling, and it didn't have to be the whole thing, but get them started on pieces of their application as part of their sprints. For those who were really keen at driving it forward, Many of them were saying, hey, what about these vulnerabilities that we have? I would really like to look further into that. You know what? That's a great use case for something teachable that you could share. Take one of these vulnerabilities that you found and share some documentation and some research on it. Teach the rest of us what you learned. Right? Automated security scanning. Do you have something that's useful to share with how you do your SAS, your DAST? Did you implement an IAST solution? Can you show the rest of us? This is demonstrating knowledge and it's applying it. And it's a short time investment with what you do. The benefit is this is actually relevant to your daily tasks. So this isn't doing it off the side of the desk and asking you out of your way. As a developer, as we submit these things, we're already doing these things. And then lastly, this is where the other part of the organizations can come into key. Things like the SOC and the SIR, the operations side of this thing. Where do we get these alerts? These are all use cases that can be written up as simple coursework to share and train with each other. Now, it's key to understanding that there has to be a little bit of a system of checks and balances in this thing. So using, if you want to use GitHub or whatever you have for a repository, you can use these things. My point is that this is how we adopted this. So what we had individuals do as they would submit their cases from their learning, they would do a pull request. Our senior engineers and developers would comment on these things. Yeah. And I saw an interesting response in a chat earlier. Anybody that approves a pull request and doesn't comment on it probably didn't read the pull request. <laughs> There's probably a lot of truth in that. But getting them involved with that is a real good way to use this because this is teachable. We take this content now and we share it. Now it's in our repos. Everybody has access to it. And so all we ask is for these senior individuals, evaluate the correctness of the solution. Did they meet the requirements? And not everybody can be a developer on this, but everybody can have input. And so it's key to make sure that you invite them to contribute. So in considering this as the artifacts, what we did was we said, we want you to generate your playbook. You can set your repository up to do this outline the expectations. And these can come from your planning sessions that you have, right? Which artifacts are gonna to need to complete it? For example, like I said, the threat modeling, the very simple novice level was take a small component of your system, draw, draw a boundary around it, and list out two things that could be vulnerabilities and then write up use cases, put them into your backlog. What are you going to do about them? It's just that simple. You're already doing it as part of your sprint. Only now there's a bigger benefit to it because now you'll get credit within this program and I'll outline that in just a minute, how we did that. So as you set these up and you have these artifacts submitted, now this practice becomes more than just educational. Now it's application. They're already doing this is what they do daily, right? And so it just becomes reinforcement and it's not just busy work as they submit their items and put them into the repos. We completely track this entire repository with several folks from different areas of the organization and they give their input and they keep improving these requirements so everybody can see openly and they contribute. If they have an idea, hey, this would be a great course. What if we wrote something on this? Great, would you mind up writing a PR for that and submit it? We'll all contribute, we'll all do it, all right? The doing obviously is taking all that knowledge and then applying it. So what I said earlier about using playbooks is getting that pattern. This is still part of your daily productive work, but now it's muscle memory because now that playbook is now part of your team's sprint cycle. Again, there's a point to this, and I'll tell you just a minute, because this is the ownership part. The first few cycles you go through will be a bit cumbersome, yes. But as you begin sharing these out to your teams, now you have the ability to adopt a common theme here. And that theme is the culture. You've now actually taken what's part of the daily work, 
setting this up so they're recognized for what they're doing without realizing that they're doing it. And the key comes through the very last pillar, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But it's important to understand that your company culture has got to be supportive of this. Everybody can contribute. It's not just the devs. It's not just security. It's the ops. It's everybody. As Alyssa said, why aren't more people coming to the table? I don't know. But you should invite them. You should give them the ability to give input and drive that. If a culture focuses on punishing failure rather than saying, what can we learn from this? Then we really haven't learned anything from when the light bulb was invented and there was 10,000 ways to figure out how not to make one, right? Having a culture where failure is always an option, we're gonna take that as a learning thing and we're gonna take that as a teaching thing and then we're gonna share that because with ownership, you've got to be able to stand up and lead. So you wanna give them to do this broadcasting this out internally and externally, give them them the recognition for standing up and sharing these things. This evokes confidence. And it's also a growth mindset. And we know that growth mindsets are how organizations stay flexible, right? It also opens up different perspectives because now we can all look at the good and the bad and the ugly. And Angie made a good point. Don't take the code personally, right? There's always ways to improve it. We all can contribute to this. I love how she said that. Look at this objectively from how to improve the process and everybody can contribute. And lastly, it's important to understand that you've got to validate the accomplishment, recognizing, creating programs where you can share these successes. If you have an internal uh, recognition program, make sure that you put those out there, make sure you broadcast this. And just as importantly, Look at things like digital badges. There are systems out there like Acclaim and Credly and others where you can create these digital badges. You can look for examples from Microsoft. You can look for examples from Amazon and IBM. They all offer these digital badges. And the advantage to this that we realized is this actually creates a culture of recognition for accomplishments. And the program that we have has four basic levels across several different key areas. It's not just security. It's also about improving some of the DevOps processes. There's even some channels that talk about how to improve the business processes from this, and there'll be badges created from this. Validating this accomplishment is what's going to do more for your organization because you recharge them and motivate them to do more and reward them for the effort, and it's part of your culture. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. And for me, that was probably the biggest lesson learned when I realized, wow, I'm around a whole bunch of smart people and together we can all move this much faster. So socializing these best practices, start out with at least two internal platforms that you have in your town halls, your DevOps communities, ask your senior leaders to recognize someone. It drives that down through this, but most importantly, don't try to do this off the side of your desk. As I said, volunteering is nice, but programs don't get funded that way, right? If we think about what Richard Branson once said, if you take care of your employees, they take care of your business. I love that quote from that guy because when you engage your employees and you motivate them like this, an engaged employee is just going to be much happier. And making culture where security is something everybody can contribute to makes it an even stronger organization. And so I'm keeping an eye on my time here, and I'm going to ask the moderator to, uh, if, if there's any questions, if you want to open it up, uh, I'm happy to take questions at this time. <clears throat> All right, Eric, good. Uh, it says, um, James says, the literal definition of Kung Fu, skill developed through time and effort, he says, I like your sensei already. <laughs> Yeah, I had to get a lot of healing to learn that lesson, let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's interesting how these cultures can come align. And, and this is something I've worked at for some time. Um, really well-known gentleman in the, in the DevSecOps community, uh, named Chris Romeo, started a program at Cisco. And you should really seek him out and learn his story because it's really one that is all about the culture. And it's amazing how he drove that. And I got inspired by that. And I got inspired by the fact that he actually approached it from a martial arts background. 
Yeah, Chris is a, a good guy. He's spoken for us a couple times. A nice guy. Let's see, I'm looking at the comments and I'm backing up a little bit. Uh, Sean, in case you've already answered, I did not see, so that was for Sean, okay. And then I've got um, risk management and risk mitigation. Larry, I'm not sure if that's referring to Eric or not, if you wanna jump in. And then Jonathan says, writing a test that confirms that functionality works is one piece, but writing a test that makes sure invalid actions are valid uh, do not work is a whole other thing. So writing for uh, invalid actions and values. Oh, absolutely. That would be a great teachable moment for everybody, uh, not, not just developers. You know, think about it. Security is about quality. We could all learn from this. You know, perhaps that maybe there's a nice... That, that, old, um, uh, that old joke about a security professional goes into a bar and places his order. You know that one, right? I think I've heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, I have a beer. I have two beers. I have three crickets. <laughs> I'll have nothing. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm asking each, uh, each person after their session, Eric, what's the one thing that you want people to take away from your session? Everybody has a place at the table. Even if they feel like they can't contribute, they can. One of the most inspirational points of Adam Shostak's um, courses in threat modeling is when he goes through one of the points of the cycle and he says, this is all about brainstorming. Every input is valid. That is just like, so applicable across more things than just step modeling. If you think about yeah. it, the culture itself, every input's valid. Everybody should contribute to this thing. And we all need to step up to the table and to offer our input constructively, right? Let's keep this constructive, right? Because we're trying to better the business. We're trying to better the culture. All right, great. You know, you I've heard you mention place at the table several times. I'm sure you're aware uh, that's Mark Schwartz's book. Mark, Mark Schwartz wrote a book called uh, A Place at the That's Table, which table. basically so it confirms what you're talking about. Bob Weston says, off topic, <laughs> listening to a talk by a guy from Optum wearing last year's Optum booth handout and hand sanitizer holder on a belt loop. <laughs> <laughs> and a co-worker just came and dropped off some company branded stuff, including one of those door opening button poking things that have gotten popular lately. I'm using coincidence. Thank you, Bob, for just that absolute non sequitur. <laughs> Very nicely done. Uh, let's see, Larry Getz says, contributing is key because someone may shed a light on an avenue that wasn't seen or considered. That is so true. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We all tend to get into our own little box, don't we, Larry? If we think about developer bias, I mean, bias in general, right? Not yes, just, yes. Developers aren't the only ones who get it. Physicians get bias, right? Everybody gets bias. It comes down in the software world to pets versus cattle, right? Like Angie said, don't get personal about it. It's code. I can't count the number of times I've botched a module or wrote something wrong because either I was too tired, too sleepy, or just focused on my own thoughts. And then when somebody said, that's not the requirement they asked for, just so you know. Well, oops, humbling moment there, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I went off on a tangent. Okay, let me get back on track, thank you. <laughs> there you go. If you'll stop sharing your screen here, we will um, kind of round up where we're headed after this. So thank you so much. Your background actually does look like you're in your studio already. So that's kind of nice. Yeah, the reality is it's all packed up sitting one room over while this room gets redone. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. Good to see you. Um, thank you.